Kia ora, everybody. Uh, welcome from Wanaka, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Uh, it's six o'clock in the morning where I am, and uh, welcome to the second session of the Guides Inside Speaker Series. Um, we'll get underway shortly. My name's Graham Charles. I'm the president of the Polar Tourism Guides Association, for those who don't know me. And we're going to get underway shortly with, with Rob McCallum and Kelvin Murray. Uh, and talk about the weird and wonderful world of private guiding. We, we came upon this idea, uh, like we do with a lot of the speaker series, with, uh, from questions from uh, folks like yourselves uh, to, who were interested or heard of this weird and wonderful world of what happens um, with these uh, either luxury yachts or small vessels or, or even um, you know, sub-diving or scuba diving in Greenland and other polar places. And people wanted to wanted a, a window into into that sort of world. And while there are other operators out there who definitely do that sort of thing, um, EOS Expeditions, uh, Rob and Kelvin, uh, probably a couple of the the more well known of of our cadre, uh, who are, you know we'd also call polar guides as well as other specialty uh, expertise. And so uh, we thought it was a good idea to invite them to join us. Um, I do want to disclose at the start that I do some work for EOS Expeditions. Uh, I work, technically call myself staff for them at some stage. Um, it, so it wasn't just a, a job for my mates to talk on this thing. Uh, as I said, they're considered the best of the best in this industry and uh, hence uh, they've been invited here. We also know each other quite well. And so if, if you're offended by the piss take, or um, people taking the piss out of each of other people, then I can only apologize in that that's kind of how we talk, Rob being a Kiwi um, and Kelvin being Scottish and working with a Kiwi. We're pretty used to that style of communication. So um, I just want you to understand that if we get in there, rather than thinking that I'm particularly rude, uh, we know that Rob's particularly rude and Kelvin is well known for it as well. So without further ado, um, welcome Rob and Kelvin. Welcome and, and thanks for the disclosure. I mean, although you have worked for us from time to time, it hasn't actually been that hard. <laughs> I'm just writing now, fire Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> could you both just give us a very brief uh, introduction to yourselves for those who don't know you? Sure, I'm uh, Rob McCallum, one of the founding partners at uh, EOS Expeditions. Uh, as Graham says, I'm a Kiwi, hence the charm, but I'm uh, living in the Massachusetts the, uh, in the United States, so a long way from home. Hi, I'm uh, Kelvin Murray. Um, as you can tell by my wildly charismatic accent, I'm from Scotland, so I'm a, a real Scotsman, not a plastic New Zealander. And the uh, I'm the Director of Expedition Operations and the uh, Undersea Projects for EOS. Uh, I'm based in Edinburgh, uh, but like uh, many of you, working worldwide. Thanks, guys. Uh, well, let's hook into it. Rob, how on earth, I, I, you know, I, I actually met you when I was about 17 years old. Rob was at that stage a newly minted um, park ranger in New Zealand and working at a... Um, uh, at a national park in, in uh, called Arthur's Pass in New Zealand. Um, but I know from, from your career, uh, certainly from when you've got into polar guiding, that you've come through the whole ranks of, of ELing for big ships and all that sort of standard part of it. How, how and why did you branch out and get into this kind of private scene? You know, I, I say to my mother, who's very confused uh, because I grew up in Papua New Guinea um, uh, before we went to New Zealand, uh, that the central theme, because she's confused, how can you grow up in the tropics and become a polar guide? I say to her that the central theme in my career has been uh, about making uh, complex things happen in remote places. And so initially that was for the National Park Service, you know, building huts, building tracks, fighting fires, conducting surveys, whatever. Uh, in remote places. So it's about getting the right people, the right gear to the right place at the right time. And then you take that sort of logistical skill and you apply it to somewhere like the United Nations, which I did for four years, and then into commercial guiding, uh, and then into technical guiding, and now into private guiding. But it's all essentially the same uh, set of skills. But when you, when you started in there, Rob, it must have been 
I mean, to branch out and make a business of it, it must have been pretty tenuous to think, oh, okay, well, you know, how, I mean, just how many, you know, weird and extreme expeditions are there that need uh, guiding and or logistics to that level? Uh, I think everybody goes through a couple of phases in their life where they have to take a, a leap of faith. Um, and, you know, my, I'm no different. I mean, I had a fantastic career in the Department of Conservation, but you know, I just knew that I, it's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I took a leap of faith. St starting EOS, uh, you know, those all those years ago, at the time it was just a bit of a lark, you know, let's, let's uh, get in there and see if we can make something of it. And, you know, before you know it, you've invested 10 years and things are going well and the rest of it's history. Um, you know, nobody remembers the... The, the, the hard stuff. I mean, there was a famous rock star who said it only takes 10 years of fucking hard work to become an overnight success. <laughs> and, and and that's true. You know, it's always stuck with me because that's absolutely true. I don't think we have a bleep button anywhere. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, thanks, Rob. Kelvin, I want to get this one out of the way because there's probably um, lots of people here thinking, ah, oh, sweet, I want to meet these guys because I want to get a job um, doing this stuff. I can certainly tell people out there from my experience in this industry that um, it's a double-edged sword working the private guiding scene. Um, the highs are very high, uh, do some absolutely incredible things, but um, having EL'd larger ships and vessels and expedition teams for 18, 16, 17, 18 years, that, that the lows are lower than uh, any <laughs> anything that I've um, experienced working larger ships. So. For any of you who are who aspire to possibly trying or getting into this world, then um, please take that as a uh, as a disclosure right from the start. But rather than all swamping Kelvin with uh, application letters, which he doesn't want, um, you're the ops you're the ops manager, Kelvin. So you place guides in private jobs uh, around the place. So you get a decent run at this. Keen to know what you what you look for in your role um, besides charisma. Um, what are what are private clients looking for, you know, and how much do you weigh up, you know, what's the relationship part of it, skills versus character? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, a, skills, obviously, straight away, but um, character is a big part of it as well. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're working in commercial guiding or private guiding, you have to have a good, strong skills base and, and how to keep yourself safe, how to keep other people safe, um, how to protect the environment that you're working in and so on. And uh, so we will look for those sort of core things, everything from, from boat handling to medical skills, uh, communications, uh, languages, um, specialist skills might be geared towards a particular job. So there's a there is that broad range of skills that, that most polar guys will be aspiring to. Um, the character part is a bit harder to put down on paper. And so usually um, we are, we almost always know in person the guides that we are working with. And, the, and we have interviewed them and we've tested them out in other teams. We've uh, asked around about them. We've taken references, all that kind of thing. We are extremely thorough. Um, and I think what the, the clients are looking for are um, authenticity. They want the, the real deal. They expect an extremely high standard. Um, and they, they expect people to be able to uh, deliver a, the trip of a lifetime and no questions asked. And, and they have to be able to do that sometimes you know, on their own or maybe a small team of, of two or three other people. So it's a very, very high bar not just from uh, from the clients but but for us as well thanks for that kelvin i'm you know i'm not sure whether <laughs> how i fit into that and how i got there having listened to you say that now so no don't, you don't. Know, can, can, can i just <laughs> come in on the back of that question because i mean uh, you know i you know uh, uh, for the organization's point of view, you know, trying to bring people up through through the ranks and, um, you know, get them to a point where, you know, they can take on senior guiding positions. We look for four things. We look for skills. That's really important. We look for senior skills. Those are the leadership skills on how to lead a trip because almost all of our staff uh, are leading the trips that they're on. Um, the third thing we look for are diplomatic skills because although 
uh, in a commercial world, you're working on a on a vessel with a, a, a captain and a hierarchy of of seafarers. On a private yacht, you might be working on a vessel that's as large or even larger than one of the commercial vessels, but you're it. You're the only interface between with the captain. And so diplomacy is sometimes pretty tricky. And then the final thing, the fourth thing, which is actually the hardest to find, is the social side of it. I think as uh, as Scots and uh, Kiwis, we have a, a natural ability to talk to anyone, be it prince or pauper. And I think that's a really important thing, which is often overlooked, because although we love to be the charming uh, guys, you know, giving people the trip of a lifetime, quite often we're the person that has to pull the owner aside and say, you know what, we can't do this and here's why. And if, you know, that's the, the true skill of leadership is being how to give uh, bad news well. Thanks, Rob. And I'll, I'll actually chime in there is from a from a technical point of view, um, I know I have this discussion with a number of guides, particularly with uh, um, some syllabi from the PTGA. Um, you know, take something like um, Zodiac driving, when people are actually tested or they run through a syllabus and they look at something like um, driving in poor visibility and strategies for dealing with that sort of stuff. When we built these syllabi through the PT with the PTGA, um, you know, we we would we had to encompass all of the ranges of work that a polar guide um, or an expedition guide might do. And I, I know that people have asked in the past, you know, how for something like driving in poor visibility, when I ask for strategies and people, if they're working on big ships, then of course there's all these rules and standard operating procedures about driving in pairs, communication with your partner or the expedition leader and all the rest of it. But if you look in there, and they've been built like this to encompass this kind of work that, as Rob has just said, that when you're working um, these private trips, you're often on your own. So you are driving in poor weather on your own and you are landing on beaches on your own and you're leading hikes on your own. And so um, those having those skills, as Rob said, to be able to um, keep yourself safe and your, and your guests, obviously, without necessarily the standard operating procedures that go with a normal um, big operation. Uh, is, is quite a, a different scene. So, Robert, you know, we, did you want to say something else? No, I was just okay. agreeing with you, Graham. <laughs> oh, really? Well, that's a first time. Hang on, let me mark yeah, that I'll up. Yeah, I'll write that down as well. Kelvin agrees. <laughs> it's been minuted. Everybody's seen that, so we're good. So it's 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 been a tricky time, uh, well, a weird time, obviously, over COVID, but with that aside, Rob, where do you see this part of the industry going over the next you know, a few years, five years? Oh, the same the same way the rest of the industry is going to go over the five years, you know, straight up. I mean, if you cast your mind back to um, to pre-COVID, you know, IECO and IATO were both uh, working out how to develop um, strategies for rapid growth, um, you know, because the, the shared fleet, you know, the expedition fleet in the world is is, you know, going to grow by 50%, 60%, whatever it is. I mean, in uh, in the Antarctic, we're expecting to see up to sixty vessels uh, in the in the next few years to come. COVID has put a pause on on play, but it hasn't slowed the shipyards down very much. And so, two things are happening at the same time. One is that uh, there's these wealth of vessels, new vessels that are going to be coming out the the next gen uh, expedition vessels. I say next gen because they're the ones that have got helicopters designed into them, submarines designed into them. You know, they're they're designed for pure expeditioning. They're not some refitted old thing, you know, a car ferry or a Russian you know, something or other. They are purpose built for expeditioning. That's happening at the same time as the world has hit pause for a year and a half, and people have been sitting there going, "My God, you know, life is not forever. I've got to get out there and do some living." And so, you know, the the prediction over the next few years is for growth to increase and increase quite rapidly. That's across the whole cruise industry. The expedition industry is no different, and the private yachting industry is just a niche within that. Yeah, was a, uh, <laughs> busy busy times. Um, let's let's try for some levity here, since you're both such serious characters. 
anything any in our title i know i just made this up in a in a in a second of madness but uh anything that you could or allowed to share an an, an insane part of this job it could be insane good or just insane crazy that goes on in the private guiding world kelvin you must have you you're He's famous for these first. stories yeah um it's it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, thing. This, you know, you know what's insane. I think people have these preconceived ideas about the uh, super yachts and their clients that they're, you know, they're they're somehow uh, these lone wolves out there just doing whatever they whatever they like, and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they're, they're they're jet skiing off of icebergs and and things like that. I mean, there's you know, I think you will generally find that that there are common parameters on what is is considered insane, um, and when. Clients come to us. They see us as the knowledge. They see us as the, um, the the people who can deliver them an incredible experience. And they might have ideas about it, but they really do say, "Right, so what do I need to do? What can I do? Where can I go? What can I see?" Etc. Um, uh, and they they take our guidance and they see our level of experience and they understand that we're talking from you know. 25 years experience or so. I think we recently we counted up the years of experience that we have in the in the office team and it's over 360 years or something like that. 180 of those years is Rob, but <laughs> the uh, um, so there's a lot there's a lot of inherent experience in uh, there. So you, when you go into a client with that sort of level of gravitas, the sort of the insane ideas sort of get get filtered out pretty pretty quickly. I think when I first joined and when I started getting involved, you know, it took me a while to get over the some of the money that was involved, you know, and I would be going, how much? It's how much for that, you know? And that was that was quite a, a, a dramatic thing for me. But then I, uh, and, and, and there, you could sometimes find yourself saying, you know, this person's paying, you know, millions for a holiday. And, and you can start to twitch a little bit about that, but then you, also find out that they've just donated a hundred million to build a children's hospital donated it you know um and that you know i said to myself well okay that person deserves a great holiday you know kind of thing it's uh <laughs> it's it's all it's it's just it's it's all relative it's just there's a different they just exist in a, in a different financial plane to the to the rest of us so that it actually once you start seeing what's going on there's not a huge amount of insanity there have been some odd requests, but um, we we take care of the insanity. I think. Rob, what do you think, Rob? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's all going back to the definition of insane. I mean, um, we've had people ask us to do very insane things, but we have a company rule that if it doesn't break a law of physics, it's absolutely doable. Um, <laughs> there we the go, last, folks. You heard it here. Yeah. I mean, the last guy that, that walked through the door with a request that could have been interpreted as insane was a guy called Victor Vescovo, who wanted to be the first guy to dive to the deepest point of each of the world's five oceans. Of course, it was insane. There wasn't even a submersible that could do half that depth on the planet. So we built one. And um, and so, you know, with this submersible and a good expedition team, he's gone out there and he's, you know, he's accomplished amazing things around the world. Calvin's just taken that team down to dive the, the deepest shipwreck known, um, dive the um, third deepest place in the um, in the on the planet, the Philippines Trench. Uh, we were both out last year at the Challenger Deep. I've just come back from Challenger Deep. So what something something would have been called uh, insane three years ago is now, you know, absolutely a reality. We've had some insanely good times. Um, you know, we've given some clients some absolutely amazing experiences, and a lot of those are things that um, you know the memories will go on, you know, right to the right to the bitter end. But it's a very interesting industry to be in because uh, you're limited really only by your uh, imagination and your creativity. There have been things that we've turned down. Um, we often turn down things which just don't fit with the philosophy of the place. You know, you won't see us jet skiing in the Antarctic or, you know, doing the sort of traditional water sports in the Antarctic because it just doesn't fit. Um, we've turned down a whole expedition once to North Korea because we thought that was distasteful. Um, insane um, but otherwise if it doesn't break a law of physics we're in let's get out a sketch of paper and work out how to do it 
Good to know. Kelvin, um, compare and contrast the day of a life of, a, of an EL, because we, we have an ELs panel coming up later in the series about how people can uh, think about developing themselves if they're, if they're part of the guiding team or an expedition team into being an EL. What, but to, or the two of you, compare and contrast the life of an EL on a private yacht. We'll keep it more traditional, Antarctical, polar-based versus a ship or large team EL. Uh, well, yeah. you hit the nail on the head there. The, the, the biggest difference is that you generally have a large team and uh, they're all there to, to do the work and you can delegate and you can stand back and you can observe what's going on and, and helicopter over the, the situation um, where, uh, you know, and a large number of people are being taken care of in their, in their little cadres by the rest of your team. But when it comes to private guiding, you know, it may be you, you are the, the team uh, and you might have a bit of assistance from some of the crew on board the yacht, um, but everything's up to you. You are the you know, you're the planner, you're the uh, assistant expedition leader, you're taking care of records, you're um, making sure all permit obligations are met, you are um, making sure all equipment's ready to go, you are keeping an eye out for wildlife, you are keeping in contact with other vessels, you are updating the schedulers, you are everything, everything is done by you. If you're lucky, there's maybe two or three other people on the, on the team, um, and then once you've done all that, you have to go and spend uh, the evening with the client, you know, having dinner with the client, uh, witty repartee and uh, all that kind of thing. And, and um, you do all the recaps yourself, you're giving lectures, the whole shebang is up to you. And it's uh, you know, long days, it's tiring, you're always, um, always available, always on alert. Um, and so that is a massive, massive difference compared to you know, a commercial operation where you have, you know, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 people all there to assist you. Um, I think one other, I think a positive out of it, though, is you get a lot more one-to-one -one time with your client, with your, your customer, and you can share the experiences. You know, it's um, uh, um, having a much smaller group, it can be a much more intimate experience. And these people want to be in these places for a reason. They, they, and they are having an amazing time, just like 100 or 200 people might be having, but you're getting to share that much more with them on a one-to-one on -one basis or, or just with their family and that kind of thing. So it's, it can be very, very uh, um, uplifting for, you, for yourself to be able to share the places that we enjoy and the places that we love working in with this you know, small family group or whatever. So it's uh, um, it can be a lot of hard work, but it can be it can be very very rewarding. I'm I'm glad you outlined all those things. I realised I must have been missing quite a few of those. So I'll, I'll try and <laughs> I'll try and pick up the game. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I you know, the thing I love about it is that uh, we always start with a blank canvas. You know, we, we when you're on a commercial trip, because of the economic uh, dynamics, you know, you're leaving a port on this day and you're going and you're, you know, if it's Tuesday, it must be, you know, Hannah Point sort of thing. Um, you know, you're following a, a, a schedule, whereas we have a blank canvas because we're only dealing with a group of, you know, maybe 20, but usually 12. Um, and so we have a lot more spontaneity. Uh, we really can seize every opportunity out of out of a, an itinerary which is you know main which is um, altered on the go and i just wanted to pick up something that kelvin said you know that our clients are really interesting people because by definition you know they're incredibly wealthy but also when you when you look past that these are people who are making the conscious decision to spend money to go on an expedition you know they're not buying another jet or another helicopter or another home they are wanting to learn more about their world and to share that with their friends and with their family we see a lot of uh, multi-generational um, trips where you know it's the one time of the year that two or maybe three layers in the family break away from the boardrooms break away from the routine and actually get out somewhere fantastic and spend quality time together and that gives a great opportunity for exerting influence so we've had many trips now where people of extreme wealth have actually made a positive contribution to 
uh, the places, uh, the place that we're in or the societies that we're interacting with because their eyes are open and they see the opportunity. So that's a really cool uh, outcome of, of what we do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, one of the big differences that I'll often recount for or tell people is I really enjoy uh, the, the private guiding scene and being able to make my own decisions and, and, and go with, uh, you know, sort of all sorts of weird things as long as they're well managed and the ability to be, as you say, a little more creative and adventurous. Um, but, but I also like, I, I enjoy the challenge of <clears throat> working with an expedition team for the leadership aspects of it, you know, less about, do I want to be on a large vessel or have 400 people or 100 people? But for me personally, I do, I do like leading a team. And, um, and that's one thing I miss, uh, certainly working on the smaller vessels, uh, is, is that you don't get to lead a team and get the feedback, have the fun have the fun times with uh, your you know, fellow guides um, and work at solve problems within a team and all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's worth thinking about as well. We, are, we do have some bounce back or not bounce back, but some questions from the folks. Um, here's one for either or both of you. In the old days, expedition guiding was super macho, polar Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones sort of job, but with people skills and, as you had said, authenticity becoming more important. Um, and uh, are there female guides present in the commercial guiding world? So, what's the situation? So, there are more female guides in the commercial guiding world. Uh, and I know at PTGA we have easily a 50 50 split of membership over 400 people. So, there's a lot of female guides in this industry. Um, someone wants to know what the situation is in the private guiding world yeah i mean we uh we pick uh, whoever's whoever's right for the job um we do try to have a, a good balance of uh, um, men and women in the team um it's a uh, sometimes there are logistical considerations that we have to factor in so on a um uh, on a a yacht, even though it's a it's a it can be a relatively large vessel with not a huge amount of people on it, you know, guide accommodation can sometimes be restricted. So um, it may have to be an all male team on board because they have to share a cabin, or we have to find uh, a, a female or a male who's happy to share with the someone of the other sex. So there's, you know, there can be um restrictions like that you know placed upon the, the the team but but other than that we aim to 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 find the the right people and, and have a good balance and we we have a, a lot of female guides in our books we we have uh, uh and not just working in the polar regions but all over the world as well so it's um sex is not any kind of barrier as far as we're concerned no, it's not a criteria at all i mean for us it's about regional um speciality so if you look at greenland's female lead melanesia's female lead i mean we you know it doesn't we, we're first and foremost interested in bringing the destination alive to the client and so it's the person who knows the most about the destination that's the first and foremost consideration it's quite often closely tied to language and also uh interaction with um, the local government um so yeah we're pretty much like the commercial industry cool Thanks, guys. Um, just from our previous question and the, and, uh, the sort of compare and contrast, and Casper just added another note, which is a which is a paradigm that I was familiar with uh, from early in this industry. Is is just these things. You're often inside someone else's home, uh, not like on a ship uh, where the staff and EL are at home and the the guests are kind of in your place. You're you're um, quite likely to be living and working inside somebody else's home which which definitely is a is a different paradigm absolutely that's why we had to teach casper to wipe his feet and chew with his mouth shut <laughs> yes <laughs> um any any trends that you're seeing uh you know as we go through the 2020s from private clients what are they you know anything they're wanting more adventure less adventure more of something heli sub skiing heli skiing what do we got uh clients are getting younger and as a result of that, unlike they us, they are yeah, they are also getting um, uh, you know more uh, physically 
active or physically capable. Um, and so that is a push towards experiential cruising where they don't just want to be taken and shown, they actually want to get out and do. Um, I think the other thing that's a shift is that people realize that that time is short and if you want to add more to your life it's got to be through authentic experiences so people are not as willing to go with cookie cutter experiences they they want something that's designed for them um, and they're happy to pay a premium for that so it's a very uh, interesting trend for all of us in the expedition industry because there's just this huge number of people that's growing all the time that want to get out there. They don't want to do a cruise. They want to do an expedition. They want to experience. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're seeing some similar trends and as you see in the, uh, the commercial world as well, you know, greater interest in science, greater interest in conservation, travel with a purpose, that kind of thing. So it's um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's similar, but it's just amped up a little bit more. And we have we have clients who, like as Rob said earlier on, once they've experienced these kind of things, they have the they have the clout and the resources to make significant uh, impacts, either politically or financially, on on these sorts of issues. So it's important for us to to um, uh, in, encourage and nourish that uh, that that interest. So that's a that's a big part of trips for us. So how many? How many private vessels, you know, or these sorts of jobs are out there? You, you know, people, uh, just to give it some context, I guess, people often ask, you know, how big is the entire polar guide industry or expedition cruise guide industry? You know, how can it support an association like PTGA? But, you know, but in terms of once you step into private guiding, I mean, just how many, how many jobs can it support? It's, it's really hard to define um, because, you know, in the commercial world, ships are designated as either cruise ships or expedition ships, you know, and expedition ships come in sort of big, medium and small. And, and yachting, I mean, virtually any private vessel, uh, you know, can become a, can, be, can do an expedition. Um, it just depends where you're going and what time of year you're, you're intending to be there. But, uh, you know, without... Being coy, I think the super yacht fleet, that's vessels over 30 metres in length, um, numbers uh, around 4,500 vessels, of which I would think, and I'm just making this figure up, uh, about 10% are expedition capable. That's, you know, when I say capable, I mean if someone rocked up with one of these 450 vessels and said, would you take this to the Antarctic, we'd say, yeah, yeah, we could do that. We might put you right in the bullseye of the weather window. Um, but, um, but yeah, the others, not so much. So um, that's a real positive, you know, that, that there are a number of vessels out there that can do this kind of work. From an employment point of view, the bad news is that the teams are incredibly small. You know, when we're operating on a vessel like the world, we might put a, which is technically the world's largest private yacht because she's privately owned, we might have an expedition team of you know 18 people on board but for most of the yachts that we're working on we have a team of two uh, you know an ice pilot and an el and that's it so we we don't actually need that many staff every year to run our trips which is why our, our sort of um, uh, stable of champions as i like to call them is relatively small yeah the so we, i mean for example we've uh we probably have, I think it's about 25 or 30 Antarctic trips slated for this forthcoming season. Um, and some of the guides will only get one or two trips because they are tailored towards specific clients and specific tasks and specialties and, and so on. Um, so there's, you know, for some many guides, it's not possible to fill out an entire season with doing this kind of thing. Um, and the demand can often be at short notice and and they, it's not planned a year and a half in advance like the you know the commercial uh, fleet and so on so it's a, it is a very very niche market Not this sure. is a this has always been our greatest challenge as a company is that uh guides like to fill their dance cards you know their their diaries up um, a year or more in advance so they have surety of employ surety of income 
And of course, the very good ones, which are the ones that we're after too, um, they're being headhunted by by big companies all the time. But our clients don't read those memos. You know, our clients typically make their decision to, let's say, for the Antarctic, they will make the decision to go in July, August, September. So it's a pretty short runway in order to find uh, to find uh, a guide that that fits. Because fitting the right guide to the right client is is paramount. So much so that often we'll have guides that do a trip with a client and then for years afterwards, whenever that client does a trip, they request the same guide because they simply hit it off. I, I know that's not been the case with you, Graham, but, you know, keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> I beg to differ, but, you know. Uh, I mean, you've seen this, you know, you, you had a group, you had a, a, you know, a client down there um, pre-COVID. And you know, next trip he goes on, he's going to take you. I mean, that's that's a testament to the relationship that develops between a, a guide and a client, be they but be they on a mountain or or on a boat. Um, you know, you there's a great deal of trust, and um, you get to see each other with uh, with, with your underbellies exposed. And how much wool you can pull over somebody's eyes. <laughs> Always back um, to the book, Graham. The so you guys aren't you guys aren't the only private yacht uh, charter type business is that is that right? We're the only ones that uh, do everything in house. So we are we are a, as the Americans would say a soup to nuts company. You know we are <laughs> a company you can call up and we'll do everything from itinerary suggestions, technical scheduling, permits, permissions, um, providing guides, ice pilots you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, there are a couple of sort of travel specialists around who will ring in people to to do that, but we're the only ones that do everything in house. Right. But if a but if a guide thinks, you know, well I can't I can't get a foot in the door um, at EOS, I'll I'll cold call, you know, Google some other company, they from from my knowledge, they might other other operators that kind of do high end charter type stuff, they don't they don't deal much with the human resource of placing placing an EL like you guys do. Is that right? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you can you can look in the industry. Uh, there's, there's telltales, right? I mean, if you look in the industry media and look at um, the membership of um, IATO and IECO. Sorry, we've just finished a two and a half hour IATO meeting, so I'm well. Um, if you look in the in the media to see who's done what and actually look at the batting average of the company, that's the best way to protect yourself um, from from signing up with someone who, you know, may not have the shore support to handle you while you're at sea. Cool. The uh, another question in from uh, the viewers in the polar regions. There are more and more ships, commercial and private. How can they cooperate in an ideal world? Uh, can commercial provide and private ships create a win-win, or should they just stay out of each other's way? Good, good question. You know, especially because you know, from my experience, you know, small yachts, private yachts on the on the peninsula generally aren't tied into the scheduler if you're in Antarctica. Um, and can move around on a whim because it's not so important that you land at 8 a.m. or 12 p.m. or, or whatever, whatever time it is, and, and you can change uh, change plans on on a dime and go somewhere else. But um, but I certainly understand the question. Got anything to add on that? Well, because we're members of both IATO and IECO, we still, you know, maintain these uh, principles of a wilderness etiquette, and we do have guidelines to follow and how we all respectfully operate around each other. Um, certainly, that's how we operate. Um, it's and and because a, a lot of us on our team already come from the commercial world, you know, we know everybody on on the ship, so it's a matter of getting on the radio and be able to coordinate with other vessels. I mean, yes, we do have, we do have a, you know, um, slightly, uh, our, our itineraries are not as fixed and, and um, not as uh, not as rigid as the as the commercial operators, um, but that also gives us, you know, increased opportunity to go off and explore other sites, or maybe the, maybe the the vessels are uh, capable of going, you know, further afield, or maybe we've got more time, or you know, 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a, a we have a, a great deal of flexibility, but undoubtedly there will be vessels that will be coming in contact with them. Um, the only way the industry will will prosper, uh, especially in the light of all the various different authorities keeping an eye of us, is if we um, act responsibly, uh, treat each other with respect, and, and all behave behave ourselves. So. Um, there's no point going around being a being a Yahoo just trying to satisfy your client. You, you know, you uh, have to um, be a respectful visitor and, and, and cooperate with your colleagues all around the area, because the, the industry is growing. There are going to be more of us in the same playground. Uh, we have a question from Gus. We've probably probably answered this in a roundabout way, but but if uh, if it needs another crack on a hundred meter private super yacht. How many guides would you place on an expedition to the Antarctic? And I know the answer is it depends. Yeah, that's right. It does because a hundred meter super yacht might only have uh, you know uh, twelve um, guests on board. Uh, most most yachts, for those that are not in the yachting business, most yachts are designed to have uh, 12, 12 guests, a capacity of twelve guests. Um, some of them have twenty, and some of the new ones may get up to twenty four, but it's never going to be much more than that. And we're often uh, sailing on a vessel which is quite large, but has less than 12. So um, the, the answer relies on what it is they want to do. If you have uh, 12 people and they're going heli skiing, then you're going to need, you know, helicopter pilot, helicopter mechanic, uh, ski guide, um, you know, yada, 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 yada. Um, if they don't have a helicopter and they don't have a sub, they're just doing a standard sort of itinerary, um, you know, nothing that has to be extra permitted then um, yeah a team of two sometimes three thanks rob um we're going to wrap it up soon folks so for viewers out there if you've got any questions you've been holding off on politely then then don't don't be polite let us know um kelvin you i know you do a lot of diving stuff which i have no knowledge about it's very clear to me that the bends have been a big part of your psychological psychological makeup um but in terms of you organising logistics, um, you know logistics um, jobs, uh, sort of using private guides, is the is the film industry transport and support scene is is that a growing part of your business? Uh, it is a growing part, but it's also been a part of our business for for quite some time. You know, we're known for doing uh, super yachts, but uh, we've been involved in logistics and film work and. And technical work, scientific work for you know for a number of years. Um, so yeah, it, it is a it is a growing part, but it's not something unusual for us. Um, if we're not doing super yachts, we're off doing some other sort of consultancy or technical project. And we've worked with you know um, BBC, Netflix, uh, uh, Disney. Um, yes, yeah, I mean all, Geo, yeah, NHK. Yeah. I mean, you name them, we've done them. Yeah. Yeah, and so and a, does placing staff is, does that become a different challenge with those sorts of things? Um, well, in terms of the polar regions, you know, you still will need those base skills, and they will still be operating under permit. So they will, you know, you'll still need suitably qualified staff who can, you know, handle a group of people. It doesn't matter if they're filmmakers or you know tourists or whatever. Um, they'll need to be able to look after them, you know, sensibly and appropriately. Uh, sometimes, you know, additional skills are uh, useful, but again, it's we we tailor. It doesn't matter the project; we tailor the the, the staff specifically to that. Um, and the guides in that sort of respect would more would usually more be geared towards um, very good on logistics. And, and really, really having a good understanding of um, a, all the technical requirements, say for a film shoot, you know, understanding that it takes a long time to set all these things up. There's a lot of equipment to move around. There's a lot of boxes to be take account for, uh, you know, and you've got to consider the weather with all that kind of thing. So it becomes a much more spreadsheet clipboard kind of thing um, rather than let's go and look at the pretty penguins and polar bears and things like that. So it can be a much more technical, logistical brain um, than, than, say, a historian, for example. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, well, almost a, it's almost a blending of the two because, you know, from a naturalist point of view, the, the 
the filmmaker wants to know, you know, I want to get a shot of, uh, you know, Gentoo checks on eggs. And you have to know as a naturalist where to be at that time of the year to go and find that. But you also need to have an understanding of how the film industry works and how a film is put together, because as Colvin says, it's, it, it's a lot to learn in terms of how much gear they've got and where it's got to go, but also what kind of uh, weather parameters they can actually get a shot in. And so we're very proud of the fact that, you know, even people like Kelvin, uh, we're very proud of Kelvin because he, he did the first live broadcast um, in 4K quality from, from the Antarctic. And that required a blend of both uh, the sort of the naturalist knowledge that he would have as a, as a guide, but also experience in filmmaking um, so that you could blend the two together and get them what it was that they wanted. When it's live, you only get one chance. <laughs> That's right. Um, we're we're going to wrap it up shortly, guys. Uh, Rob, you, you mentioned before that uh, you had these plans for the season. What, what are your thoughts about this season? Is there going to be an Antarctic? 21-22 uh, season or an Arctic? Uh, I don't think there'll be an Arctic season. Uh, I do think that the Antarctic season will go ahead, but uh, it'll be uh, revised. Uh, it won't be uh, a standard um, season. Um, you know, there is so much inconsistency around the world at the moment in the way that COVID is being managed. Um, and and it's about the the home country of the, uh, of the participants, um, you know, are the people coming on the trip have they been vaccinated and then it's it's about the conduit needed to get them from their country to the start line uh chile is doing quite well argentina not so much you know we've still got a long way to go maybe by november december uh, there'll be a protocol in place that enables people to get from their home country through a gateway and down to the continent kelvin anything from your end of the world <laughs> well i'm just going to get my crystal ball out and, uh, <laughs> now I've been uh, I, I've been dealing primarily with the the Arctic, and and that has been a I can imagine that it's been a very frustrating time for a lot of the guides out there, just simply not knowing. Um, and uh, just as Rob's on the executive IATO, I'm on the executive of of IACO, and so we're really seeing some of the kind of really hard uh, moments that a lot of these these companies are facing, uh, and of course that filters down to the to the teams. So, um, yeah, the Arctic season is not looking, uh, it's not looking great, um, but there are other opportunities within that that we are able to, to work with, with our private vessels. Um, so we're, we're making something of it. Um, but uh, yeah, for the commercial, uh, commercial operators, it's pretty, um, pretty hard times. Yes, well, well, um, well, thanks, guys. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat to us. Um, we'll we'll release Kelvin's uh, personal home number and email so everyone can swamp him with uh, job requests uh, next week. Um, but thanks, folks, for signing in with us on session two of the speaker series. Um, next next uh, next week we have Inside Echo um, with uh, with Frig Jorgensen. From, who's the head of ACO and Charles Jacobson uh, in the discussion with our uh, with Pat Lurcock, who many of you know um, from the industry uh, and who works on the who advises the PTGA from our from an advisory board position. Um, but uh, and thanks thanks once again, team, for taking the time from your respective parts of the world, and um, I look forward to that um, the job and inquiry in, in the mail. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Graham. Yeah.